us this morning to, we're going to start Matthew 13, then we'll be over in Revelation 3, and then I'm going to get into the book of Hebrews a little bit this morning. It's going to be a, I believe it's going to be a real lesson this morning. I wasn't exactly for sure how this would, uh, the Lord would put this together for, for us, but uh, I believe it'll help us this morning. And uh, you pray for us and ask God's blessing upon the service. Yes, Lord. I thought about doing two separate Sundays on this, but I believe we're just going to do one, move right through it. But uh, let me say just a word before we get started. But uh, we're dealing with church history and getting into the different uh, teachings that's come along in church history, the different denominations, the branches, and all that. And one of the most controversial things, and I'm not afraid to deal with the things that, that sometimes are controversial and sometimes they offend people, but that's just the way it is. But uh, one of the most controversial things that I've ever dealt with in my ministry and any church, especially in our area, is the security of the believer. Yeah. That is the number one controversial thing. Is a person that is saved, really saved eternally, a person that has truly been born again. I'm not talking about somebody that has a profession, that there's never a new birth, a change in their life. The Bible said if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Amen. I mean, can you really know that you're saved? Yeah. Uh, many denominations uh, say that you can't, can't until eternity comes. Can you know that you're saved? Can you know that you're saved eternal? And how many times can you be saved? Now we're going to deal with all this this morning from the Bible, the yes. Word of God. Yes. So won't you turn with us to Matthew 13. Yes. The Baptists are one of the very few denominations in the world that teach the security of the beliefs. Amen. And we even have branches in the Baptists that do not believe this. Right. And I guess the fundamental Baptist, uh, the missionary Baptist, the independent Baptist are the champions of the security of the believer. Now this will be one of the things, if you're here this morning as a young Christian, uh, this will be one of the hurdles that you have to overcome <coughs> in your life Amen. that you'll have to be settled on if you're going to be a Christian that has uh, faith and assurance and has a clear understanding of the scripture. So this morning we're going to deal with this. You pray for us. Yes, and uh, we, uh, we're going to get into this. And uh, I guess the, the worst bunch on this is, is not the Baptist. Uh, I don't, I'm not going to go in to, to all that. But uh, I guess the worst, the worst bunch in the world that keeps their uh, people insecure is the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church gives no security to their to their church, they have to come back every Sunday to the Mass and literally offer up Jesus yeah. every Sunday for the forgiveness of their sin Bless and have to go to the confessional every Sunday. Yeah. And still, that does not give them the assurance once life is over, they enter into what they call a purgatory state an in between heaven and hell. And from there, if they have done enough works, <laughs> They've done enough uh, sacraments, indulgencies, paid enough money for their sin, uh, they'll be ushered in through the priest. And my friend, the Bible is totally foreign to any kind of teaching Amen. like that. Right, this is all man-made, it's all heresy, and it keeps the believers or the people that of that faith, it keeps them in a position where they never have a security. They have no more assurance the day of their death than the day that they was converted to the Catholic faith. That's sad this morning, Andy. Yeah. Now, us Baptist people, we champion the individual priesthood believer. And uh, I'm not going to say all Baptists, but the majority of Baptists champion the eternal life and the security of the believer. So I'm going to deal with this briefly from the Word of God this morning. Bless and I hope it's a blessing to us. And you, some of you may have never heard this, so it's going to be something new to you. But I want you to take your Bible, and I want you to hear what the Word of God says. So let's start in Matthew 13, 33. 
We'll read one verse in this parable of 11. It uh, references also to the church of Thyatira. We're going to read about it. Jesus said in Matthew 13, 33, he said, Another parable spake he unto them, The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took, hid in three measures of meal, till the whole was leavened. Now, my friend, up until the up until the church of Pergamos, as we taught, and the birth in A.D. 315 of, the, of, the, of Romanism and the Catholic system, the church was essentially pure. The, the professing church, the possessing church was essentially pure up to that point from a lot of false doctrine. But at the birth of the Catholic church, brother, there's an onslaught from the devil he couldn't destroy the church externally outwardly. We studied that, so he turns internally, don't he? Yes. And last week we dealt with the, the grain of mustard seed and the church of Pergamos. So this week we're going to take this a step further, and you find in this parable in verse 33, you find three, three measures of meal. Now, if you'll study this out, what you'll find in this teaching is this. If you just take a if you just take meal and uh, water, you just basically, uh, you take meal and water, flour and water, you basically get what's called uh, unleavened bread. Uh, there's no agency in it uh, to, to get the bread that you get off your shelf today in the store of the leaven. Uh, that bread's gotta go through a state of what we call corruption. Mm -hmm. There's things placed in that that makes it grow, makes it rise, amen? Right. And the Bible describes here this period of time as a woman, notice that, a woman took leaven and hid it in the three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. Now if you took a, if you took a pile of unleavened bread and then you took a pile of leavened bread One's pure, one's unpure, and you took the leaven that was corrupted in the Bible that always speaks of a sense of evil, right? Yeah. I mean, all the way through Scripture, when God's people come out of Egypt, they was allowed no unleavened bread, no leavened bread in the Passover. And uh, Jesus said, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So leaven, if you took leavened bread that had been corrupted and had risen, and you placed it into the into the meal mm -hmm. that was pure, guess what happens? Well, you say, I thought the church was going to convert the world. No, what's happened is the opposite. The world has come to corrupt the church. That's, right. That's what Jesus is teaching here. And one of the things that has corrupted the church world is this. There's very few people in this world that actually believe that they can know that they're saved. Amen. That they can know they're going to heaven Amen. and that they can know that they're eternally saved and they're saved now. Amen. I, I champion this cause. I champion this doctrine. I teach it, preach it unapologetically and I'll not back up on it to anybody at any time in my life. Amen. 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 And uh, I love you. I pray for you. I want you to be here. But if you can't handle this doctrine, you're in the wrong church this morning. My friend, this is the champion cause. Jesus said, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Amen. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. He said, my sheep know my voice, and they follow me, and a stranger they will not follow. Now, friend, you got to watch this. you got to watch that crowd that follows the corruption. The crowd that follows the false teaching, you, you mark them, you watch them, and what you'll find is this, that their life is full of sin, they're weak in faith, they're all the time down, they're all the time button, they're goats instead of sheep. My friend, Jesus said, my sheep know my voice, and a stranger they will not follow. Does anybody in the church this morning know that you're saved? Amen. 
Amen. Amen. If the Lord would call today, do you have the assurance that uh, you, the Lord will say, enter into the joy of the Lord? Amen. So Paul said, and, and the Bible teaches, he said, uh, for which cause I suffer these things, nevertheless I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I've believed, and I'm persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Amen. I can quote you probably 40 verses right now on the security of the believer. Yeah. Uh, but we don't have time to do that, so I've got to move on. But one of the things I want you to notice about this, now this is what happened in the church world. The church was pure in 315 A.D., and then you have the mustard seed, you have the branches and the fowls attack the, the, the kingdom, Brother Wayne. And then the next parable Jesus gives is the leaven attacking the pure meal and it's corrupting the church world. My friend, the church world today is corrupt. Mm -hmm. Amen? It's corrupt. But in the, the church world, Christian, the mixed multitude, the masses, there is a true body of Christ. There is pure believers that are saved now. And my friend, if you have that assurance this morning, I promise you, you're in the minority. The majority of the people in the world today don't know whether they're saved or not. Right. Amen. So we got to be careful. We've got to champion this cause. And even in the Baptist today, we have many branches of the Baptist that do not hold to this. But we this morning that believe this, this is a pure doctrine that must be taught, must be preached, and must be mentioned very often. Amen. Because if I don't know anything else this morning, I want you to know that you're saved. I want you to know you're saved eternally. And I want you to know that you've got a home in heaven when you die. Amen. Don't let anybody take that from you. That's right. Rob you with that blessing in your life. It's the most blessed thing that God will ever show you after you get saved is the eternal life of the believer. Amen. 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 So this morning, but notice there's a woman involved in this parable. The woman took the meat, the leaven, and corrupted the meal. Any time in the Bible, the majority of the time when you find a woman mentioned in the teachings of the Bible, it's a sense of evil. This woman was out of place. But what we're going to find out, God shows uh, this corruption. By the evil of false friends. You know what God caused the great system I'm talking about this morning? He caused it the great harvest. Yeah. Now one Sunday, I'll try to get over there and I'll do a whole lesson on Revelation 17. And you'll be amazed what the Bible says about this harvest. Yeah. So let's read what uh, Jesus called it now in Revelation chapter 2. I may have said 3, but we need to be in chapter 2. I want to read just a few verses here, then i got to get into the Hebrews epistle. But in Revelation 2, let's start reading verse 18. And you'll find Jezebel mentioned here. That's amazing that there's that connection between these two passages, ain't it? In Revelation 2, 18, under the angel of the church of Thyatira, Thyatira, write these things, saith the Son of God, who has the eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works charity, service, and faith, and thy patience, and thy works, and the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which called herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Now, we have a reference here to Jezebel. I went back this week and I read a little bit on Jezebel. It's been a while since I uh, read on that. I didn't read much of it. But when you study Jezebel, you know, she, she's been dead. She's been gone. Uh, she was uh, uh, basically uh, murdered by Jehu. Yeah. And uh, the dogs eat her flesh, didn't they? Yeah. The dogs eat her and licked her blood. She's the most wicked woman in all the Bible. There's two names in Scripture that I would never want anybody to ever be called. One's Jezebel and the other's Judas. They're just two names that go down in the history of the world with great evil and great apostasy against the Lord. Amen. Jezebel was a woman that withstood Elijah. And uh, 
She was married to a husband named Ahab. And she stands for false religion, Brother Wayne. And she took the prophets of the groves and the prophets in her table, 450, and withstood Elijah, the prophet of God, the nation of Israel. And she murdered the prophets. She tore down the altars. And she caused great spiritual apostasy in Israel. And in the reign of her husband Ahab, they moved the kingdom from Jerusalem and from the throne of David to Samaria. Uh, they, they left the temple in Jerusalem, Solomon's temple, and rather they built a uh, temple in Samaria that stood into the day Jesus walked the world. And brother, I mean, you just think about what kind of false she brought in Baal worship. And you know, we know the great story when Elijah stood on Carmel and brother and stood against the prophets of Baal. And Elijah, brother, the prophets of Baal cried and prayed and never could get fire from heaven. But I believe Elijah spoke a handful of words and the fire fell. Amen. Amen. So, friend, God had a battle, battle of the ages on Mount Carmel against Jezebel and her prophets. And you know, Jezebel, she was prolonged at that day until Elijah was taken to heaven. And, of course, Jehu, uh, God's executioner, later on in 2 Kings, Jezebel went to her death. Now, friend, God has let this thing go on for many years. Uh, what I'm telling you this morning's went on for about 1,700 years. But just as Jezebel fell on that day, when the rapture of the church takes place, brother, the kingdom's going to come crumbling down on her again. Right. It speaks of the false religious system, the heresy that, and God said here, because you suffered that woman Jezebel, which called herself a prophecy, to teach and seduce my servants to commit fornication and eat things sacrificed to idols. Now guess what happened in this period of the church of Thyteria? Guess what happened? The leaven come to the meal, didn't it? Jezebel and that false religion got in the church world. And the, this is the longest span now. Uh, Brother uh, Schofield gives it from A.D. 500 to A.D. 1500. Uh, Brother Larkin, or not Brother... Uh, Harold Wilmington says 590 to 1517. So 1,000 years, Brother Jezebel reigned over the church. And that's what I want to show you this morning. And in that 1,000 thousand year span, it was during that century that God typified the church of Thyteria in that period of time that's called the Dark Ages. That the, now this is what was attacked in that 1,000 year period. I'm getting back to my original statement. The completeness and the finished work of Christ was denied in the church. And in that period of time, in Thyatira, Thyatira was added works for salvation, sacraments, mass, ceremonial, and rituals. And my friend this morning, if you're saved and you know it and you're in a church that believes the Bible this morning, you ought to stand to your feet, raise your arms, and shout glory towards Amen. heaven. Yeah. You don't listen. Some of you, this is all you know this morning. You're in a small minority this morning. That's why we need to keep the doors open, need to keep the Bible open, need to have clear Bible teaching and preaching present to you and challenge you as Christians to examine your faith. Amen. Because there's a mass multitude of confusion in the world. Now the reason the historians call this uh, Thyteria period the Dark Ages is this. Because this thousand year period, the Catholic Church had an ironclad grip on religion over the masses of the world, Wayne. Yeah. Now next week we're going to deal with Sardis. So we're going to see the Great Reformation. When... Uh, men began to stand and preach boldly against the Pope and against Rome and against these errors. When men began to question the authority of Rome and out of this we find the great reformation that was Protestant in Germany and mainly in France and Switzerland. We find the birth of a couple of denominations 
uh, the Presbyterians, yeah. and we find the Lutherans. Now this shook the Roman world, this shook the Roman church. When men stood and questioned Rome. And I thank God for the Protestant Reformation. But they brought out many errors with them, and we'll deal with some of that next week. Baptists have never been Protestant or Catholic. Baptists are a separate identity this morning. Amen. We'll get into that. But let me hurry. I've got to hurry. But this is what it represents. Now, the word Thyatira means continual sacrifice. Now, I've got to hurry. Let me read just a couple more verses. Now, this really goes into next week, verse 21. You may want to mark this. This is a prophecy right here. The Lord said, I gave her a space of time to do what? Repent. To repent of her fornication. And guess what? She repented not. Now, that's the Reformation. That's the great Reformation. God gave the Catholic Church in the era of Romanism a couple hundred years to turn. And guess what she did? She never turned, age. The Catholics began to to persecute the Protestants, and then the Catholics began to persecute the Baptist that was born during this time. So let's read on down, and no wonder God saved because of this. He said, Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and then they commit adultery with her in the great tribulation. Mark that down, for that's a prophecy. Except they repent of their deeds. Now there is hope for people that is called up in false religion to be brought out. Amen? Amen. God said they're going to have to repent of what they do, what they believe. He said, I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he, which search the reins of the hearts, and will give to every one of you according to your works. Now let me say this before I move on. If you read that just normally as a Christian, I don't mean nothing to you. Very little. But when you begin to examine church history and you begin to examine it in a prophetic light, now, brother, that means something this morning. Yeah. Now, I don't have my church with me, but the true church goes up in the rapture. Right. Amen? Amen. Well, what happens to the false church? It is spewed out into what? The tribulation. Mm -hmm. The true church goes up, the false church is spewed Amen. out. Amen. Now, now this morning, if you're religious, some people don't have no religion. You can tell by the way they talk and by the way they live. Amen. Mm -hmm. But if you're religious this morning, you either belong to two, one or two churches, the true church or the false church. Right. And friend, if you're saved this morning and you know the Lord and the free pardon of sin, you're greatly blessed. Because we live in a sea of apostasy, don't we? But the Lord give them a space to repent. We'll do with that next week. Now I want to take what time I've got left, which is probably about 15 minutes. I don't know if I can get through all this, but I, I pray God will help us. But this is what I want you to see. The word thatira means continual offering, continual sacrifice. Now, for the last 15, 1600 years, Catholic meets every Sunday to have their mass and they have their confession and they pay their tithes for their salvation. Now, some of them may not believe that, but that's the majority. And friend, for 1,600 years, the teaching of this period of the church presents a continual sacrifice. They actually believe every time they do the mass, the priest has the power to literally bring Jesus down from heaven, place him into the bread, communion bread, and take his blood from heaven and place it in the wine. They believe the literal work of taking the bread and the wine each Sunday is salvation for them, and they have to do it once a week to be uh, to have any assurance of their faith. My friend, I'm glad Jesus died one time. Amen. Never to die again. That's what I'm going to show you. Amen. But Thyatira represents a generation of the church history when religion was not satisfied with one sacrifice for Christ, which was Christ for sin on the cross. 2,000 years, the Catholic 
every Sunday at Mass offers Jesus as a continual sacrifice. They put him to death every Sunday. They crucify the Son of God once a week afresh, again, anew. And this is what the Mass is. Now, my friend, I want to tell you something this morning. Yes. By the grace of God, I'm not going to put Jesus back on the cross. He died one time. To never die again. Amen. Will you turn your Bible with me, the book of Hebrews? You need these scriptures. You ought to mark these. You ought to study them. And if I can ever help you this morning, if I can ever help you, you know where I'm at. But this right here, these scriptures settle this this, this morning. I've got several passages in Hebrews. We'll get as many as we can. But let's start in Hebrews 5, verse 11. Hebrews 5 and 11, of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing you're a dull of hearing. Now, I'm taking this just a little bit out of context this morning. The book of Hebrews was wrote in A.D. 64, six years before the temple was destroyed by Titus in A.D. 70. God tried to get the Jews to uh, come out from the Mosaical Law, from the Old Testament offerings, they never ceased to offer their sacrifices 70 years after Jesus died. They wanted to continue on in the old covenant age, yeah. but Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice that ended all other offerings. So in the, in the context, it's a little different than the mass, but it's the same, same picture. These Jews was going back to their temple, wanted to continually offer Jesus up every day, wasn't it? Listen, friend, if you've been saved this morning, you've ever been to Calvary, you've ever received Christ as your salvation, listen, you will have to come back to this altar many times for fellowship, but you only come to God for one time for salvation Amen. if you truly come. Amen. Now, wherever that point was in your life, whether you was a young person, a middle-aged person, if you've ever really truly been converted, now the devil will come to you and tell you you're not saved, that if you were saved, you would not do this or do that. Listen, there's a fleshly aspect to this. Amen. And what you need more than anything else, amen, is to learn the Word of God. Amen. Amen. You need the Bible yep. to fight against the adversary. Right. The devil will tell you you have to go back many times, but the Bible said one time. one time. So let's read this. So God's people's hard of hearing, and it goes against everything we've ever been taught. The assurance of salvation. For when the time you ought to be teachers, he's speaking to the Jews, you have need that one teach you again. Now you gotta remember these Jews, the majority of them, the ones he's right to here in Hebrew were saved, brother. But though they, they were saved, they were still thought they had to take an offering. When I first got saved, I knew nothing about the security of the believer. Right. I was told you'll never, you'll never endure, you'll never make it. You, you'll never do good enough. You'll never work your way to heaven. And for about the first six months, I just didn't understand, brother. I thought if I'd done one thing wrong, I was lost again. Mm -hmm. That is the normal interpretation of salvation. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. That's what we think. Yeah. And that's the normal interpretation of all religion. Uh -huh. But as I got into the Word of God, Bless you. And begin to listen to God's men preach and Amen. begin to examine the, the canon of the scriptures. Guess what? I found the very opposite. Amen. I found that God's able to save to the uttermost. Amen. I felt that there was no, no other need for me to ever go back for my salvation. My salvation was complete in Him, finished at the cross. Amen. So think about that this morning. Think about that. So let's read on. Verse 12, he said, For when the time you ought to be teachers, you have need one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. Now, the first principles, that is the, the simple elementary teachings of the word. Now, I'm really, this morning, I'm giving you some myth. Listen, I'm trying in my little weak way to set you a table, give you this food, and I'm trying to bring it up to your mouth, amen, and put it in your mouth for you, but I can't chew it for you. That's right. Amen? Amen. So you're going to have to taste this and see that the Lord's good. And what I'm teaching you this morning, brother, every, every Christian, every good Christian, 
Every good church has this settled. Now this is a simple elementary teaching in the, in the church, brother, that's been settled for 2,000 years. Yeah, yeah. But the vast majority of the church world has no assurance this morning. Right. I appreciate Brother Lane. One thing about him is, brother, he don't back up on the grace of God and he preaches the assurance of the believer. I'm in the same boat with him. Amen. We're going down the same stream. When you say, Brother Travis, everybody don't believe like that. That's all right. I love them. I try to help them. But, Brother, yeah. listen, I'm not backing up one bit on this. I know yeah. what the Bible teaches. Amen. I know what the scripture says. Yes, well, you say this person done that and this and done this. And well, listen, I can't help what they've done, brother. God will deal with them. If they're a son, they'll be chasing. If they're a son, brother, and they, and they go into sin, in a habitual sin, willful sin. Uh, God said that he will judge willful sin in the body now on this earth. Amen. And he will shorten man's days. God will take care of that. Amen. Right. I don't Amen. have to explain that. God will take care of that. Yes, will. Now you say, what about those that was no change? Well, they've never been saved. Right. I'm talking about those that have truly trusted Christ by faith and repentance their salvation. They are saved once and they're saved eternally. Amen. Right. So let's read on. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. Be strong, but strong meat belongs to them that are full of age, even though those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to serve both good and evil. Let's read on. Therefore, leaving the principles the writer of Hebrew commands the Jews to lead the simple elementary doctrine of Christ. Now this is a simple thing, children. Let us go on to perfection. That word perfection means maturity and completion. If you do not understand what I'm teaching you this morning, church, you have gone as far as you can go in your Christian faith. You may reject this. You may run from it. You may run to a different domination, a different church, different preacher. That's fine. I don't want to see anybody leave, but I'm telling you this morning, until you get this settled in your life as a Christian, you have gone as far as you can go with God. God commands us. Let us do what? Go on to perfection, to completion. Now, here's the danger. This is what the Catholic does, and this is what... Uh, the Jews were doing. God commands us to do what? Not laying again the foundation. Not redoing it. Not laying again the foundation. Not laying again the foundation. My friend, when the, when the Catholic goes to Mass every Sunday, they practice the unscriptural teaching that Jesus must die anew again each time they teach that Jesus must go back each Sunday and die again. They put Jesus to death, friend, in 1,500 years, thousands and thousands and thousands of times. Yep. Well, you say, Brother Travis, how many times did Jesus die? One time. Now, let me give you the scripture. The foundation repents from dead works, faith towards God, the doctrine of baptism, laying on the hands, resurrection of the dead, the eternal judgment. And God said this would happen, children. He said it would happen. He said this we will do if God permitted. You say, why has God permitted all this to happen? Well, my friend, Jesus told it was going to happen. God let it happen. Just like God said he would let it happen, guess what? It happened, didn't it? God has permitted it. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened, have tasted of the heavenly gift, or were made partakers of the Holy Ghost, and if you've ever been saved this morning, God has enlightened you. Yes. It's called illumination, enlightenment. He's revealed to you by revelation, the inspire, inspiration. And inspiration, illumination, revelation are three giant words that basically mean this. They mean that God has took the Bible. He has took the story of the gospel and he has revealed that to you, give you faith to believe that, and you've accepted that for your only salvation Amen. by faith, believing the gospel. Amen. And when you do that, the Bible said you have everlasting life. Right. 
Now, if you've ever been enlightened and you've tasted of that heavenly gift and you was made a partaker of the Holy Ghost and you've tasted the good word of God, can I get amen right there? Amen. And the powers of the world to come. Now, if you're saved, brother, you, you've experienced that. But we come to verse number six and we come to the climax of the lesson this morning. If they shall fall away. The Bible never teaches that a man can be saved more than once. The Bible says you're saved once. Now we've got people in the Baptist that teach you can be saved not once, twice, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten times. Now my friend, that is totally foreign to the word of God. Now this is what the Bible would say. Now we have a hypothetical here. Now this is not possible, but if it was, the Bible said if you could fall away. Now what the Jews thought when they brought their sacrifices every day to that priest in that temple, you know what they thought they had to be saved again. They thought they had to have a continual sacrifice. The Catholic says we got to have a continual offering. The Baptist says it's done, amen. Amen. It's done. It's over. Yeah. Now, if you could fall away and you could become lost once you're saved, the Bible tells us what would have to happen for you to be re-saved. To renew them again under repentance, that means to be saved again. Seeing they crucified themselves, the Son of God afresh, that means again, and put him to an open shame. Now, friend, if you really believe this morning, that you have to be saved as the Catholic does every Sunday, re-saved. If you believe like some Baptist branches do, that you can be saved more than once, according to this scripture, which is a hypothetical, the only way, if you ever lost your salvation, that you could ever be re-saved again, would be that Jesus would have to come down from heaven, yeah. go back to the cross the second time, and die again. Yeah. Now, some of you look like it's depressing you this morning. On, I'm telling you this morning, I'm dealing with a subject that you need to know. That's right. That's right. According to this scripture, if you could really fall away and lose your salvation, there would never be no hope for a person to ever be saved again. That's, right. That's what the Bible says there in a hypothetical. Is if you ever lost your salvation, if they, the Bible says, let me read to you again. If they shall fall away, to renew them again to repentance, be saved, Jesus would have to be crucified the second time. Right. And, if we, and if you was able to bring him back from heaven, put him on that cross, you'd bring everything he'd done the first time to a shame. Right. I want to tell you this morning, friend, the Baptist people have championed the cause of one Lord, one faith, one baptism, right. uh, salvation by grace through Amen. faith. Plus nothing minor. Listen, friend, I'm saved this morning. I have that security, and I'll never have to go back again to do it over. Now, listen, you say, well, Brother Travis, I'm just not sure I'm saved this morning. Well, you need to get that settled. Yeah. Say, my life's a mess. I don't live right. I don't do right. I don't have a desire to do what the Lord's called me to do. Well, that's another issue, amen. There's a fleshly man, there's a spiritual man. We've got to make a decision whether we're all in for God or we're all in for the world as a Christian. Right, right. That's a separate matter. But I promise you, if you've ever accepted Christ and you've been saved, you're saved eternal. Right. Amen. Right. Boy, it's getting quiet, but that's all right. All right Hebrews chapter 7, verse 23. I've got to move on. Hebrews 7, 23. Lord help us. I know this is putting some people in shock this morning, but that's all right. <laughs> Hebrews 7, 23. And they truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. But this man, because he continueth ever, has an unchangeable priest. Now listen to the Bible. Do you know that up to Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is the, he, he was the last priest from the lineage of Aaron. Jesus Christ fulfilled the Aaronic priesthood, the Levitical priesthood. He fulfilled everything the law required. 
And when he died, brother, and what I'm going to show you, he took his blood into heaven, placed it on the mercy seat of God, and give us eternal redemption. There'll never be another offering or sacrifice ever given for salvation. God's already took care of that. We don't look, uh, the Old Testament looked to the cross for the Lord to come as the Lamb to do the work of salvation. We look back 2,000 years later, H, on the finished work, brother, we see the Lord has sat down. Amen? Right. And he says this, Wherefore he is able also to save them to what? The uttermost. The uttermost. That means completely, eternally. That come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Amen. Now where is Jesus at this morning? Now friend, he's not in a piece of bread. He's not in a glass of wine. He's not confessional. He's not in a priest. He was the last priest, brother, that went into heaven. And guess where he is this morning? He's seated on the right hand of God. What's he doing there? He's making intercession for me and you. He's our mediator. He's our advocate. He's our great high priest that passed into heavens by his own blood, sitting down on the right hand of God. And as long as he's in heaven on the right hand of God, I'm secure. Amen? Yeah. That's right. Oh, yes, friend. Ain't that something to think about? He's able to save to the uttermost. For such a high priest became a, became a, for such an high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separated from sinners, made higher than the heavens. Now watch this, Hebrews 7, 27, the golden verse. Who needeth not what? Daily, as those high priests, to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sin and then for the people. For this he did what? Once, Once when he offered up himself. Oh, friend, look up here. I'm about to shout this morning. Amen. Jesus died one time, but never die again. Amen. Oh, what a Savior. Holy, harmless, separated from sin, undefiled. Went to the cross one time, H. Paid the ultimate price for me and you. Shed his blood for the sin of the world. And God thought so much of his death, 72 hours later, he raised him in the same body, brother. And 50 to 40 days later, carried him in heaven where he's been seated as a priest at the right hand of God. Oh, listen, friend, when I'm up and down and all around and my life's a mess and I don't have no desire and I don't have the testimony God wants me to have and I don't have the, the assurance that God wants me to have, I've got one in heaven, amen, pleading the blood. Amen. I've got a daysman. Amen. I've got a mediator that pleads my cause. Yes. Well, you say, Brother Crouch, the day may come, you may not have your senses. You may not know. You may not have your mind. That'd be all right, friend. It's all settled. Amen. The old account settled. Amen. It's paid for. Yeah. My name's in the book of life. Amen. Amen. Jesus paid the price. I received him as my sacrifice, as my offering. He offered his life one time. I don't need the mass. I don't need the confessional. I don't need the, the penance. I don't need the indulgences. I don't have to pay for my sins. Jesus paid for my sins on the cross in the body. Amen. So this morning, friend, there's a great difference of what the Bible says and what the Catholic teaches. Now listen to this. In Thyatira, the continual offering, now this is the statement of their faith. Catholic refers to the Mass as the summit of their Christian experience, the Christian life. They say the Mass is the climax of the, of the, of the Romanism. They say it is the high point of the, of the Catholic faith. The, mass, the oath of Mass, the priest reaches up to heaven, brings down Christ, to be offered upon the altar every Sunday. The priest has the power to take the bread, turn it into the literal body, and take the wine and make it the literal blood. And brother, every Sunday, the Catholic has to go back and follow this. They follow the mass with a time of confessional behind closed doors 
to a man that has the power to forgive their sin. I want to tell you, friend, that ain't what I got. I'm against it. I'm not for it. I'm for the Bible. Amen? Amen. I'll try to win this bunch. But listen, they're not welcome in this pulpit. They're not welcome in this church. Their doctrine is heresy. Their doctrine is a doctrine of devils. And my friend, if they don't repent, God's casting them into tribulation. Well, you say, Brother Travis, you're just way too radical. I'm no more radical than the Bible. Amen? Turn on with me. Let me close. Hebrews 9, verse 11. Hebrews 9, 11. Now watch what Jesus did for us, church. That Christ becoming a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands. That is to say, not of this building. Now watch this. Neither by the blood of goats and, and calves, but by his own blood, the blood of God. Mm -hmm. He entered in once into the holy place having obtained, you're to mark this, eternal redemption for us. Amen. Oh, my friend, you're talking about holy ground. Yeah. You remember when Jesus rose from the dead, he first appeared unto Mary Magdalene, whom he cast out seven devils. Mary desired to touch him. She noticed his voice, didn't she? But he said, touch me not, for I'm not yet ascended into glory to the Father. But just a little bit later on, you find him meeting the other women down the road from the tomb, and they coming and touching him and worshiping him at his feet. What happened? My friend, from the time Jesus met Mary Magdalene until he met the other Marys, he ascended into heaven and took every drop of the blood at Calvary. Amen. He went into heaven, friend, and went into the throne of God, into the tabernacle of God in heaven, the temple of God in heaven, yes. went into the behind into the mercy seat and he put every drop of blood on that mercy seat and the Bible said he entered in there not by the blood of bulls and goats as the old priest did but by his own blood. Amen. What a bad friend. Amen. What a time. Amen. And he offered that up yes. that me and you could obtain eternal redemption. Amen. Amen. The only redemption God has is eternal there is no temporal salvation. That's right. And that's what the Catholic teach. Oh, friend, what a message this morning. Yes. What a message here. I can read on, but let me drop down here. What the scriptures we giving you? Hebrews 10, 24, But Christ has not entered into the holy place made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself. Oh, bless his name. Now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entered in the holy place every year with the blood of others. For then must he have often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world has he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Now in your mind the sin debt or the sin question may not be answered. In the mind of the world, the sin question is not answered. In the mind of religion and Romanism, the sin question is not answered. Even in some Baptist circles, the sin question is not answered. But I'm telling you in God's mind, and in the mind of Christ, in the mind of the believer that has assurance, what sin, amen? Sin is gone, amen? Amen. Where are your sins? There is no sin, brother. It's all been paid for, past, present, and future. Amen. God buried in the depths of the sea. You could go in there off the Philippine Islands and you can measure down to the deepest part of the sea. And if you took the highest mountain in the world, Mount Everest, and you put it down in that deepest part of the sea, the water would still cover it, my friend. I want to tell you, that's where God's buried every one of our sins. Amen. In a place that no man can go to. He cast them behind our back. 
He buried them. He washed them away. Now listen, friend. Your sin may defeat you. Your sin may beset you. You'll have problems in this flesh with sin. But I want to tell you something. In the mind of God and through Christ, when the Lord, when just as he told the Jews in the Passover, he said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Listen to me. There is no condemnation Amen. to the believer this morning. Well, you say, Brother Travis, how can we stand with assurance and say our people, we know they're in heaven, we know we'll meet again on the promises of the Bible, friend. That's right. I know I'll meet my loved ones Amen. that died in the Lord. Amen. I know we will spend eternity together. Yep. I know the labor and the toll we that we put in this church has not been in vain. I know we'll meet again in a land one day where we'll never die. Nobody will grow old. Nobody will suffer again, brother and sister. Because the Lord has paid the price. Amen. And gone prepare us a place. So Christ wants all for the sins of many. And to them that look for him, shall he appear the second time without seeing any Sabbath. Anybody looking for him this morning? Amen. Amen. Ain't that a blessing? What scriptures? I'm going to close here with this. Hebrews 10, verse number 10. Oh, what a book. Hebrews this morning. What scriptures? Oh. Hebrews 10, 10. Now listen to this in closing. By the which will we are sanctified and being set apart yes, sir. through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. What's that say? Once for all. Once for all. <laughs> is that what Brother Travis has taught you this morning? That's what I taught you, Annie. We champion that. And every priest standeth daily ministering, offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. Oh, but Hebrews 10, 12. You ought to remember this verse. But this man, mm -hmm. but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins, forever sit down on the right hand of God. From henceforth expecting to his enemies he's made his footstool. For by one offering he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. Amen. Now let me let me give this to you closing. You're saved this morning, you're saved never to be lost. Now what you do with your life is totally up to you. Amen. I cannot live your life for you. Everybody has a different circumstance, situation. I come from nothing, amen from nothing. And the day God saved me, he completely changed my whole life. Amen. And there's not been one day in the last 27 years I've ever looked back. I mean, friend, it was so overwhelming in my life what God done for me. I want to tell you something. I never met a man like Jesus. Never met anybody like the Lord. Oh, my friend, what a day. But you think about it. You just think about it. What we do is up to us. But salvation is settled. Salvation's eternal. I am saved never to be lost. And my friend, I have a hard time this morning. Now, if you want to lose me, you just start preaching to me a condition-based salvation, work-based salvation. You lose me in about 30 seconds. I'm totally against that. I don't support it. I'm against it. And I'll try to help these young preachers. But these young preachers, they're going to have to learn, friend, that salvation is eternal. That's right. That's and it's right. by grace. That's right. Amen. Amen. God's got to show them. I'll try to help them, but God's got to show them. Amen. You're complete in him. Saved, never to be lost. You say, well, Brother Travis, how did God say this? He said, by one offering, he has completed them that ever that are sanctified. Now, how did God, how did God put a ribbon and a bowl upon salvation? How, how did God take everything that I've mentioned to you this morning? And this is the final statement. Now, how, how did God signify all of this that Jesus done for us through salvation, my friend. Well, you know when Jesus got to heaven, now if you study the Old Testament, you'll find the priests, there was only one seat in the tabernacle of the temple. It's called the mercy seat. And that priest only went back there one day, 
year in Leviticus 16 on the Day of Atonement, Wayne. And he went in there with the, the robe on with bells on. And they tied a rope to him in case they had to drag him out if God killed him if he went without blood. But you know, the priest ne never could rest. The earthly priest could never rest. Never rest from sun up to sundown. Do you know what happened when Jesus got to heaven? Do you know what God the Father said? He said, Son, will you sit down? Sit down on the right hand. To win, to make all your enemies my footstool. Now, friend, you may be concerned about a lot of things this morning, but I'm telling you, God is not concerned about salvation. Now, what should we do this morning? What did Jesus do in the work of salvation when he went to heaven? He sat down and he's resting today. He's resting, Brother Wayne, until he returns. You know what God wants us to do? He wants us to go to heaven, H. Not by walking, not by running, not by climbing. He wants us to go to heaven sitting. As Jesus sat down, the day God saved you, you sit down in the finished work of the cross. And Jesus said, "My," he said, I, he said, come unto me, all oh, you that labor and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Right. My friend, I've been resting for 26 years in the blessings of God. Oh, my friend, what a salvation this morning. Anybody in the church this morning glad you're a child of God? You are rejoiced, friend. This is almost too much. God bless you. Amen.